Welcome to ML Ops Live, a podcast by Neptune AI. We host in-depth discussions where machine learning practitioners answer questions from other practitioners about one subject related to production machine learning and ML Ops. Tune in to get real-life stories, dirty hacks, and pragmatic workarounds from ML people in the trenches. Welcome to ML Ops Live. We are back at it again. I'm Sabine, your host, joined by my co-host, Steven. It's Steven's birthday. Happy birthday, Steven. Thanks, Sabine. Thank you. All right. And with us today, we have Phil Basford. Hi, Phil. Hi, everybody. Happy birthday, Stephen. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> we'll be talking about some cloud topics today. Our topic with Phil here is building well-architected machine learning solutions on AWS. So welcome again, Phil. Uh, you are the head of solution engineering and CTO of AI and ML at InnoWisdom. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I've been in the post for the CTO post for uh, nearly just at the turn of the year. And before that, yeah, head of solution for the last few years at InnoWisdom. Awesome. So to get into a bit of your background, you have a degree in computer science and you kind of started out your career as a developer, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In the social gaming space, I started out there and um, developed lots of things there and then moved to social media and chat and that kind of thing. And then moved on to the AI and ML space about nearly four years ago, I joined in Wisdom. Right. And uh, you mentioned you were at this company called Pal Ringo, for, mm -hmm. for example, or maybe you didn't mention it, <laughs> but yep. that's where you got into adopting AWS for your company. So is that kind of generally where you got into more into cloud? Yeah, very much so back then. That's three years back, but I was helping them migrate their existing kind of infrastructure and architecture and platform, everything to the cloud. And I was kind of the, one of the main architects behind that and instigators behind that and led them through that, that period and got them into that. And then part of behind that was modernizing the architecture at the same point with microservices and forming a data lake and that kind of thing. Kind of got into it. To, um, my uh, boss at the time joined and he just showed me a AWS keynote from Bernard Vogel's keynote from reInvent. Uh, that year and that kind of captured my imagination of what could be done and then I attended a number of pop-up lofts and things in London where some of the uh, advocates are talking that kind of thing and um, yeah that's kind of went from there and uh, luckily at, at Paringo a good chance to apply some of that in, in real life and some good practical experience. Awesome so that sounds like a few quite comprehensive projects in that vein. But so is, did you really uh, get into the machine learning side of things at Inner Wisdom or, or was that also at a previous point? It was kind of the actual machine learning side of it. Yes, it's very much when I joined in Wisdom, I hadn't done any actual kind of machine learning before, but at the previous place with Paringo, I'd done, like I said, a bit of data analytics and data analytics, that kind of thing. And the, I've got an old, this is my architecture video where we've done some kind of real-time recommendations, that kind of thing. We never got part to the point of actually using a, an ML recommendation engine. We, we Ours was more kind of homebrew, uh, rule-based kind of thing, but that's, that was the kind of start of kind of using data to influence behaviors and that kind of thing. And then when I joined in a wisdom that started me on machine learning properly and um, along the road of ML ops and everything that came with it. Awesome. We'll be getting into the questions here in just a moment. Uh, but before that, let's welcome our audience as well. So just a reminder, this is an interactive Q&A session. Phil is here to answer any questions you might have about today's topic or MLOps uh, in general. So all you need to do to ask is you can raise your hand here in Zoom and you can ask your question live or you can use the chat to type it out there as well and we'll pick it up. If you want to ask anonymously, you can also do that by sending a direct message to me in, in the Zoom chat. And just as a reminder, this is going to be released as a podcast later on, so you can catch up with it in that form as well. All right, so Phil, back to you to warm you up a little bit here before we dive in. How would you explain in about one minute what sort of architecting machine learning solutions well is all about? I think generally it's understanding all the different layers of what actually it takes to deliver a machine learning solution and a model 
and that's all the way from understanding networking and that kind of thing and then how to handle data data pipelines and then into the more sophisticated bit of understanding kind of ml pipelines and also understanding how they're different and how they're unique and it comes with how you deal with data scientists and giving them opportunities and what they need but also provide them with a lot of structure and rigor so it's about that and then make sure that you deliver that for for a purpose be it whatever your personal project is or your your company is or whatever it has to be purposely driven and um, focused on deliverables i would say that was very well summarized thank you very much phil all right Stephen, over to you awesome thanks again phil for for sharing that insight and you know it's time to dive into lots of questions from the community but first uh we sort of uh, have some premeditated questions and i think one of them is one i'm really excited to know and it's i just want to know from your perspective what does it take to architect a good ML, ML solution, whether, whether that's AWS or any other cloud platform, what does it take there? I think it, it's with all actual solutions in the end. I think simplicity is actually the number one thing, actually. We'll dig into that later, but for all the different pillars and stuff, the architect framework and different questions. But I think I've always tried to keep it any like architectural decision or design I make, I try to make as simple as it needs to be to solve the problem it, it's, it can still be somewhat complex, but it has to be mm-hmm. as simple as it can be. Also, minimize, and I read a bit about this the other day, but there's some new papers out about technical debt and that kind of thing, making sure that you're making the right traders up the right time. Note there's going to be times where you want to invest and make sure that's deep on a certain area to make sure that it's done right because it's really critical, and others where you can maybe choose to come back to do that later but if you're going to choose that make sure that you leave that in a good state in a state where you know that you can come back and kind of service that that debt in the uh that debt and um kind of sort it out so it, it's about trading those things and making sure i suppose the one thing i learned throughout my career is actually the technology and everything can be as good as and it can be but you have to make sure again it comes back to business and all that you have to make sure it is timely and that it will deliver what you want. There's no point kind of gold plating these things or taking too long about them. It's important to get something out, but make sure you get out, get it in a way that you can come back and revisit things later and improve it without necessarily tearing it all down and starting again. Awesome. Thanks for, for sharing that. I know, of course, with your work at Inner Wisdom now, it's kind of like a consultancy itself. And I'd love us to walk us through your thought process for designing and implementing maybe an ML solution or any use case you have an example for on AWS or Inner Wisdom, how do you decide like what services leverage, you know, the team structure, design principles, coding patterns and things like that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I was we, we would start again, it's kind of, if you, we call it different things in AWS, but it's the custom obsession thing. We call it kind of values and outcomes. What we want to do is kind of understand really what, we want that machine learning to do what the um, solution will do for the client in terms of its business, where it is in the business, how they're going to use it and make sure that it's got the maximum buy-in possible from uh, stakeholders and that kind of thing. So it's important to set all of that scene and then how we select the services we are. It would genuinely lead itself from those requirements. So if, if we see something that is a kind of a big monthly thing, we will gravitate towards batch processing and more longer running jobs, be that maybe jobs and things like glue and that kind of thing for data processing and then SageMaker for batch transform, that kind of thing. So we'll gravitate towards that. Or if it's more a real-time thing, we'll focus a lot more on things like and see and response times and scaling, that kind of thing. So we'll um, then gravitate towards maybe using API gateways and lambdas and, and things like that. So it tends to be that we tend to, I said, we try to keep it as simple as possible. So we try to we kind of, if you think for a stack, we'll start like the most serverless we can. We always will try to do something as serverless we can. And then when we can't do that, we'll move down to Docker and then down to things like EC2 and that kind of thing if, if we have to, but we try to keep it as kind of minimize all the maintenance and put on as much as the, of the AWS um, cloud as possible. So we'll focus at the, the top end and work down, basically. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, in terms of like the sort of the templates, now what I mean by templates is uh, 
does the team just have this sort of certain set out principle that you say, hey, look, we are architecting a solution. Now, obviously, we have like the, you know, maybe like the security is, is a crucial thing, but also maybe there's a lead down template you follow. And also as a follow up to that, of course, is the in terms of the culture, how does that influence the architectural decisions, those architectural decisions as well? In terms of templating and that kind of thing, the solutions themselves, when we generally build them, they're not actually that templated, but we'll be using elements beneath that to help things. So if we do need to use a network, we will have standard um, CloudFormation scripts that will set up all the all the VPC in a standard way, that kind of thing. Or if we're going to use things like Code Pipeline to build code, that kind of thing, and code build, then we'll have some standard ways of setting that up. But the actual kind of individual APIs, responses, that kind of thing, will all be more or less tailored to the individual use case and the individual solution. So we'll pull against those two things. And internally, we have a kind of a design first kind of culture. So the project will come to a kind of a weekly um, design, we call it design support called design forum, where we, they can ask from the rest of the company, their expertise, how they would do it when they're faced with a problem. So we try to pull on all of our different experiences throughout the team. In terms of composition of team, that will vary and depending on stage of the project the kind of what it is so if it's an ml project principally if it's at the discovery stage it'll be very heavy on the kind of the data science end where we're doing eda and experiments and that kind of thing but as it moves into like an mvp or a full production system it will move away from the data scientists per se and move more into other engineers and we typically see like an ml engineer and, and a data engineer and a few other people in, in that space. And uh, we generally have quite a, a tight bunch of quite expertise, um, experts in their field on a, a given project with our typical project teams, only probably about five to six people, but they're a team of normally um, quite experts in their relatively field. Their relative field. So when you mean experts, do you mean like people who are really good in that so, domain? Yeah. yeah, so you'll have, we have a, what we call a data engineer, which will be very into ingestion, ETL, how to land data properly, transform it and get it available. They will know a bit about a bit about data ops and help data ops pipelines. Yeah. We'll have an ML engineer, which would be very experienced in designing and retraining of models and that kind of thing. And then, we, then we'd have... We, have, we then would have other experts, so it, we tend to would have to, like a, we call it a cloud engineer, uh, somebody who who's responsible for the infrastructure, so networking, that kind of thing. So we we definitely need to focus it down on individual skills areas to make sure that we get strong and people that know each domain quite deep, and then bring them together. All right, yeah. And in terms of culture, and when I think about culture, I'm thinking about okay, maybe you start a project, and the first thing you're thinking about is automating maybe like the dev or deployment environment, trying to ensure that you get something out like an MVP ASA. So how is the culture, like uh, what are those cultures sort of, and does it vary across the project or are they more consistent across each project? I suppose it varies across the project. Fundamentally though, they're like the culture surpasses the kind of the skills. Our cultures is passionate people, experienced people, people that take pride in their work you know and you'll see that for all the different engineers all the different stages and data scientists what it means at different stages is different things so for the data scientist initial discovery of data they're not worrying about how well that that's going to fit into a pipeline that's going to be created maybe at the mvp stage but they are trying to do the best dda they've got they're trying to ex do the experiments and come up with the best proof of concept because they're trying to show the value of what they're trying to do and, and what it means to the potential for the business that's going to take their models. So we have a, like a strong culture on quality all the way through the life cycle. It means different things at different stages, that's for sure. All right. Before all right. we head yeah. into the next question, we do have one from the audience. Sorry to cut you off. Muhammad, go ahead. Hi, Phil. Uh, hi, everyone. It's Mohammed. I'm based in Pakistan and I'm a data scientist by profession. So I have a quick question. How are the, some of the best practice deployment environment and development tools one can use for MLOps? That's a great question. So MLOps in itself is like quite a varied area. It's important to understand the tooling. I think generally still from the data science point of view, things like a, a Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Labs, that kind of thing is still really good. But wherever you, whatever is 
that hosted upon so it might be that that's hosted as part of the, the sage Mac system or you may be using databricks or something like that um for your notebooks or you might be standing up it yourself that's so important and when it comes to ml ops i think i'm yet to say i'd like one great tool that actually solves all the problems i think when you're into the actual code you still can't beat a proper ide and i mean the likes of pycharm and BS code, that's still fun. When we're production in use cases, we are fundamentally still writing Python code and using those kind of tools. Where is to leverage the cloud for training and, and that kind of thing is quite important. Some of the efforts SageMaker have gone to is quite good from AWS. With like Studio, it's extremely good, but it's starting to hide lots of the detail from you. And us being practitioners, we sometimes want to be able to control certain aspects. I don't think there is one great tool yet. I think that's still to be absolutely mastered properly. And I think it's that particularly the ML engineering experience is the one. It's like how you debug and, and step through stuff properly, really, really properly. How do you want unit testing and that kind of thing in the you know, integrated way is still the way to go. So I still think it's actually out there, but I'd still recommend using tools like MFflow or SageMaker's inbuilt model registry and that kind of thing to help improve your processes. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Muhammad. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Awesome. Thanks for coming to the questions and thanks for, for sharing that insight. And I think if you if you notice from the the title of the this particular episode, it's probably you would have noticed that it's gotten from the AWS well architected machine learning lens, well architected framework. And I would love to know, Phil, how much has that particular framework from AWS influenced your decision in terms of design and implementing ML solutions on AWS? So it's one of the most um the well architect thing overall is one of the most critical parts of how we go about any solution on AWS. It is kind of fundamental how we design everything. I would say in a um, very practical way as well as not just a theoretical way. We we kind of are constantly reviewing designs and solutions for designs and when they're live reviewing no reviewing those solutions against all of the pillars all the time and we try to embody most of the aspects of that in everything we do so it's been very critical to how we build solutions most of our solutions would be deemed well architected most of the time if we run a review on every single bit of them all the time which we don't but we what we do do is we do run our own internal reviews all the time on, on the workloads to the same standards there is times when like our, even our own standards surpass some of the well architected standards and sometimes we're a bit pre them so for, for a long time they didn't have the ml lens and lots of what the ML ends is based on what we've seen happen and how we would go about stuff generally. So it's been critical to how we've gone about designing solutions. And that another best practice for AWS is what we evaluate our solutions against daily. And when we review our, our customer solutions, anything they've built, we will review it against those pillars and conduct reviews and that kind of thing. So it's it's critical. I suppose the one thing, just being honest and transparent, is we're really hot on the five original pillars because they're just, I still think they're a good architect, a good representation of the strong old engineering principles that we all should have, all should kind of know and build upon the one thing still to, it's a bit of a challenge is kind of the six peer and the sustainability that's still um a bit more of a work in progress i think that's probably a bit of more work in progress for most of us to understand truly how to do stuff in a sustainable way and the trade-offs and, and that kind of thing um and we'll probably do more of that the one thing like the well architected lens is a little weak on is in the security section when it comes to machine learning specifically how to protect your machine learning there is a lot in it already but we're going to see a lot more kind of adversarial attacks on machine learning and that kind of thing in the in the future as it comes more critical to things and i feel that there'll be a lot more uh, specific machine learning stuff that will come in that side of the lens that pillar of the lens uh, in the not too distant future yeah i mean the, the good stuff about the doc is that it's um constantly being updated it's exciting stuff yeah i do know that there's going to be yet another revision any time now as well mm -hmm. so that, that'll be the first i think like the ml lens is on its third iteration already and it's only been out just under two years so that both says they're listening evolving it to mm -hmm. best practice and it yeah. also shows the how much the industry as a whole is moving in, in this area the, the first lens when a copy of the ml lens probably wouldn't have had a feature store in it but now it does have a feature store in it evolving as the 
discipline in itself is evolving, I'd say. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And in a wisdom, of course, you'd work with like clients from big to small and then, you know, worked on a lot of projects and use cases. You've seen different implementations of ML solutions, both on the cloud and away from the cloud. And I would love to know what does an overkill solution, overkill solution, ML solution on AWS look like? And have you seen anyone like that before? Maybe a use case? Yeah, so generally overkill comes to, is more in the kind of, it comes back to like delivering it kind of fast i see the things i see overkill is when somebody's took six to nine months to develop the whole pipeline and everything to support a model to get it to production so that it's out when and i've seen it when it goes out then it's not used or it's not used well so it's definitely that um the overkill is like spending too much time baking it too well more focus need, needs to be on the kind of further up the stream to be able to get a kind of a even may, maybe not a full integrated solution to fully develop but be able to run run it side by side with whatever's there currently or be able to test it in the in the wild and get actually feedback on it first before you go and invest six nine months because six nine months of a like a five person team is is a lot of time and energy and if you've not completely proven it out and tested out the requirements because i went back earlier i said it's important to understand holders all that but they will change their mind or they you'll misinterpret them whatever and and it's just critical to kind of make more iterative drops of these solutions to make sure you avoid that overkill because i've yeah i've seen projects take nine months and then don't see the light of day after that and you're like oh, why have you invested that much time time resource both us that, or whoever in it so that's the that's the main thing and then yeah it's a lot of it is around tooling and that kind of thing don't complete if it's like your first day or doing machine learning don't try and understand all feature store all of model registries all of that from from the get-go just try and get something established first and worry about some of that some of the governance later that's obviously not the case in big enterprises they have to worry about it but on a definitely on a, on a the small in the scale is just make sure that you kind of deliver that first iteration as fast as possible as be as viable as possible but, oh and everybody says mvp i always focus on the viable bit everybody normally focuses on the minimal bit the viable bits is important but that's the main thing is don't spend too much don't spend lots and lots of time developing complicated pipelines then because the model might not need to be training as fast as or as often as you need it for example yeah yeah that makes sense that makes sense and in contrast have you seen on the queue solutions of course <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of it's a delicate thing based on everything I just said. There's yeah. the opposite way of where the, kind of the low code stuff I find quite scary. It's quite interesting if you're going to do something experimental, but there seems to then be a, an assumption that because you can do that initial experiment really fast, that the whole thing is going to be really fast and really simple. The main kind of conversation I always have is about resetting that expectation. It's like, okay, you might be able to produce that model in no time, but it's going to going to have to go back and actually think how we're going to scale it and all that properly so it's that assumption sometimes and then people throwing them out and then realizing that after the event that's the thing it's like you can like seismic studio brilliant you can devise a model in in, in a few hours no problem uh, and yeah get it out there whatever but be realistic about what you're, you're you're doing and don't think that it's going to be the finished model also the finished solution that's the main thing and Particularly when, and this is no offense to data scientists generally, but it's, it makes it so simple that you just don't realize the complexity and you can get yourself into lots of hot water in, uh, in like how to do the network and all of that without realizing it. So yeah, that's the main thing. Sage making everything makes it slick so simple, but it's still, when you do it at scale, you want to meet a, a full solution and it's still an investment. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I think we have to jump right into the community questions now. We have a scenario-based question that was asked in the MLS community a while back. And this person asked client A, uh, a scenario-based mm -hmm. question, of course, client A has about 20 ML and deep learning models on premise and exposed as Flask and other client, uh, uh, and client apps for consumption. Client B has 200 models on prem and exposed and integrated to various legacy applications both have various challenges with scalability, security, adoption, and performance, and want to migrate to the cloud. You know, what's the, the different short and long-term AI strategy for them? And what are the key considerations and high-level approach? 
uh, will be given to these clients, right? That will convince them to adopt cloud for ML. Yeah, okay. that is a good question. So two things. So for both of them, I think I would try to understand how to more or less lift and shift those models from where they are into something on the cloud. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about completely putting them into SageMaker or completely modernizing them in terms of tooling initially. I would try to move even straight onto EC2 or just host them into something like Docker straight away and just see if that and try and work on more on what's causing them and, and, and trying to put them maybe behind a more stable API so that you can start changing stuff, stuff later. So I kind of, I would build it out from that regard and try to start working on decoupling where possible them from what's consuming them or simplifying what's consuming them so that I can then re-architect it a bit more between the backgrounds. One thing I would have different between the use cases, when it's 200, 300 models, I would early doors be looking at how to manage them using maybe something like a, a model registry or, or something like that to make sure that I knew where all the models were consistently. And I just dig deep on what the actual requirements were regarding retraining and, and that kind of thing. And then I would choose probably like the suites use case. So it's very easy to choose a simple use case. That's not going to prove anything in that, in, in most of those regards. I would choose a fairly reasonably complicated one, but probably not one completely critical to the business, but one important to the business. And then focus down on seeing if I can, how I'd go about re-architecting that. And I probably would look at how to break down its architecture, see if it's using the appropriate data stores, if it is using containers, if it's using that properly, maybe it's a case of that you can maybe also break it up and once you understand more about its scaling and that kind of thing, and then either the stage makes it serve the model or depending on the need, just keep it inside the containers. And then longer term, I would be building, building out, out a lot more, more pipelines to manage those two, especially at 200, use case I, I don't think unless it 200 different use cases that's the hard one and um, versus maybe a, a lots of models inside one use case so assuming it's lots of different use cases i don't think it's really feasible to, to keep an eye on all of them as a human at, at once so I'd, I'd be looking at pipelines and how to monitor them all better and understand how they're being used better and then focus more on providing kind of operational layer at the top of them that understand what's going on and reporting back on them because i don't think everybody's going to be focused focusing on all of those models at, at the same time because that would be a that would be both and so it would be about how to then accelerate new models and work on new um, use cases right and i think when teams hear experts talk about SageMaker or you know mm -hmm. the suite of solutions be it around SageMaker, they think about the cost right obviously you're building things on aws so definitely it has to scale at some points but you think about the costs associated with SageMaker, and people talk about how expensive it is and everything have you sort of seen small teams leverage like SageMaker while managing to keep the costs low? That's a great question. SageMaker, there's definitely a SageMaker tax involved. It's even on the instance size, it's a little bit more than you normally pay. I think some of, I want to give SageMaker its dues, okay? So let's just talk about like training. Yeah, you can train a model on anything, EC2, content, whatever, but I am going to struggle to be able to build something that has Data parallels them, GPU parallels them, able to scale the GPUs, able to debug everything properly, maintain all the different Docker images and dependency packages correctly, be able to do all the metrics and reporting back. All of that is, is for that tax, it, it is part of what you'd have to do anyway if you're looking at it. So I think like for training, especially, actually SageMaker make is really good value because you'd struggle to do it of all the all those functionalities and other way where it is expensive i think and they and they're obviously starting to address this now but it always was with kind of the inference side and particularly around not real time not batch you know it's very much you either have what needed the use case of 100 new seconds response time and you do an endpoint and you could warrant the endpoint cost because of the throughput and the criticality of the use case that's very rarely do we see them type of use cases most of the ones we see is batch and that's kind of okay but the nine share or another great thing is like the event occasional workloads or workloads that don't have need a like 
requests every three seconds once a day or that kind of thing and, and that's where sagemen is quite expensive because you can staying up an endpoint for that amount of time is expensive and they haven't worked really on how to scale it to zero and all that stuff properly at the time and batch was a bit too clunky and a bit too for that kind of thing even if you went down to micro batch it still wasn't really responsive enough or um, for that kind of event driven or occasional workloads so we normally to be honest at that point we would have gone to SageMaker and um, not SageMaker we'd have gone away from SageMaker and started using Lambda or um, something like particularly Lambda in that many regards so we would we typically would run those kind of models in Lambda for uh, like event driven architectures or or low volume architectures the main weakness being lack of lack of GPU and, and that's expensive in its own right but for most of our use cases we'd have gone that down that route obviously SageMaker brought out now the asynchronous endpoints and also the Lambda serverless, so the SageMaker serverless to address all that. But I would look in the detail. It doesn't have all the features that all the other bits have. So I would, at this point, still be using Lambda because I would want the control, but um, they may get there with things like GPU eventually, we hope. But, and the other thing is, and Studio tries to address this, but sometimes, and it does a, an okay job at it, but it's notebooks. They, the main, <laughs> one of the main things we do is we have, in the wisdom is that we have automated scripts that turn off notebooks and stuff because they just get left on and left on with like a, a, a massive GPU attached that someone's played with. And it's fair enough, they've, they've trained something in, in what, 10 minutes and got a good answer, but then they go and leave that, that size instance up for a day. And that's where you start getting some of the bills, the big bills come in. So we do a lot in that kind of area, just make sure that things are turned off when they're not being used, that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, this question is from the community, and this person is asking, generally, what are the problems associated with building ML solutions on the cloud? The problems are, it's, we, so the most, the hardest thing, and that's why maybe the cultural thing is, is significant in wisdom sometimes because we try to have a very us culture and we're in it together kind of thing. It's the light, the day you have to turn like a notebook into a production use case, and very few data scientists can write like application quality Python code. It's, it's not what they're doing, they're experimenting with data and models and that kind of thing. And likewise, it's very hard to find data and um, developers that understand what machine learning is and that kind of thing so it's that that's where the most critical skill is luckily we have quite a few of them in the wisdom but it's that how to take that notebook and productionize it properly understand that logic because anybody out there who's looked at science code it's full of pandas frames and manipulation and all that and it, and it does great stuff it's really powerful but it's not going to be performant generally and it's not in a way that most engineers would work and understand it. So that's that's where we see kind of the most difficulty putting stuff in the cloud. That and it's generally education of things like turning things off and cloud serverless and that kind of thing. We still see lots of people approaching it like from an item from a kind of a budgetary point capex. So it's still that education of what the cloud really is and how it can scale and that kind of thing. The other thing from an ML space, if you step back from the actual engineering side of it, the kind of other thing is from a from the business point of view, because most cloud spend is still on. So most of the cloud budget per se comes through the IT CIO route. Still for us, it is making, it's trying to operate not necessarily in that space or alongside that space, but also be part of the business. And the hardest thing sometimes is bringing those worlds together. I have been on a number of gigs where the IT is just operating in its original mindset. And it's fair enough that they do that in a certain way. And businesses are operating completely different. And really to be able to like be, have a data strategy, data centric, and then using machine learning, you have to change all of that really to, to leverage it. It has to be a, a very different relationship. Uh, that's the most cultural change in a, in a business to be more data driven fundamentally and see the data as the asset and machine learning as a way to exploit that. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Phil. We'll jump right into another instance based question. And this was asked in the MLS community by Gagan. He's working on consuming an entity recognition API on product data and is required to do it at scale. The scenario is that an endpoint, an API endpoint exists, which is deployed on, deployed on ML, AWS SageMaker. There are a lot of artifacts and text on which he wants to apply the entity recognition API on. These artifacts are stored in a SQL database and they need to be pulled and the 
API applied at the artifact at scale. You know, the predictions also need to be stored back into a, a database so another service can retrieve them. Do you have any suggestion on what kind of architecture would make sense here? Maybe a design pattern or hmm. something like that? I would abandon the perceived real-time nature of this, unless there's another reason that's not apparent in those requirements in, in, in that question. I would abandon the real-time nature and look to go to batch because of the volume. And then I would split it up, split the back up, the batch up into a couple of phases. One that gets all the data as a dump out of the database in the most efficient way, and maybe storing it in something like S3 that the, the, the data science or the model can process. And then I would then do a batch transform of that model and then with the results in S3, load it back into the database as a kind of a subsequent step. The reason why the batch is quite interesting and the reason why, like, I, f- I think they said it was like a SageMaker API is that the SageMaker batch API and endpoint, real-time endpoint API is actually the same API. It's called differently by SageMaker, but even when SageMaker does its batch transform, what it will do is will batch up 100 or 1,000 individual requests to an M- the endpoint style interface and send it through. So it's still actually using that kind of same logic. So you shouldn't really need to change too much of your code in that regard to be able to take that from a, and turn it into like a batch paradigm. And that's probably the most efficient way of doing predicting against millions and millions of rows in, in, a, in a database. The other option, and you'd have to dig into the exact detail, is if you could bring that into something like Redshift, you could then use the ML inside Redshift feature. So that's a way of then being able to run that directly on that data set. So that maybe is another a possibility is to, is to put it into somewhere like that and run run an uh, ML process like that on that data. But I think in that regards, it would take more of a coding change and change to how the model is, is constructed or, or how the inference around the model is constructed to allow that to happen. Yeah, I hope that's a satisfactory answer. Okay, I got more great insight there. That one. So I'm guessing this person is uh, probably also runs a consultancy, but they're asking, you know, what are some of your war stories building AWS uh, ML solutions on AWS? Having worked with lots of clients, of course. Yeah, they're all the all most of them are the same, and it comes back okay. to the business bit. Is like I'm always shocked, like on when you've delivered this stuff for months, or you, it costs you so much to train it, or whatever, and then. You turn around and like the business says, oh yeah, we're not using it, or it's not right, and that kind of thing. I'm always shocked by that's the worst thing. It's like when these people have missed so much time and they've and it's been identified as something really important for their business, but then it's not actually used. That is still the most scary bit. Other war stories is yeah, is people lo- leaving notebooks on for hours or days and not coming back to it. That's a that's always that's why we always put a bit more vigor around that. The other thing is it comes a bit about the solutionizing of the previous question is using the right tool for the right job. And it might not ever be immediately obvious and you might have to optimize it. So a good one was that we were writing a pipe we were we, we had some code given to us and we we're writing this pipeline and we hosted it in Docker and it was doing a pre-processing step of relabeling all of its data uh, before it trained the model, some of the stuff. It was on about probably a data set of like 300 million rows. And it was a kind of a geographical thing. And it would take days to actually label this data, two or three days to actually label this data properly based on two data in two separate tables that you could easily link. And it blowed it, have to load it in batches into the pre-processing stage and into the container and everything. And it's really, it's going to take, we're going to face quite a, a job to scale it. And then um, me and the DE at the time, also a data architect, sat down and thought, well, why are we doing it like this? Because we'd been given this code and we thought that's how to do it. And then what we did was we, um, luckily for us, like Redshift had recently launched at that point, and this was about two years ago, geospatial features inside Redshift. So we're like, okay, why don't we just, do it in Redshift then. So we wrote a bit of SQL in Redshift and a simple kind of update statement in the end. Nothing actually that complicated, but it applied the same kind of logic as the Python. And um, we got it down for like two or three days to about three hours and then eventually down to about an hour to label it millions of rows. That was what Redshift is really good at. So that's one of the main things is, is you see a lot of the data preparation done in the, the data science world. Sometimes it's better to push that into the kind of the data engineering world because they might be able to use a, um, the full scale of something like Redshift to help you. So it's, it is about 
I think sometimes just yeah taking a step back and looking at and using the white tool for like job and it might not be and you have to kind of take egos a bit out of it because it's like oh that's your responsibility no the best technology for that is to use redshift and that sort of stuff etc so it's important to break break that down and use the white tool yeah that makes sense that makes sense it's the right tool for the job okay another question from the community and this was asked by Niraj and He's trying to evaluate different experiment tracking tools. You know, what are the advantages of using SageMaker experiments over MLflow besides being a managed service on AWS? That's a great question. So I am personally not that experienced as data from the data science background, I'm, as you know, more from the developer background and the engineering background. So I haven't done too much exploration of, of both. Um, I have data scientists that use both in the team and Hand on heart, they actually say MFO is slightly better, more comprehensive at this point than the, the SageMaker experiment tracking. So I'd always kind of look to see if that's a viable way to go. But you do have to think about, obviously, the, the managed service aspect of it. On AWS, there isn't a MFO offering at all. It is SageMaker, unlike other cloud providers. So if you there will be the complexity of being able to run, having to run it. So either you have to stand it up yourself on a Kubernetes cluster, or if you're lucky enough to have a Databricks hanging around, maybe Databricks, but you still have to stand it up and you'll look after it. That is an important consideration, but it's still the best tool. But SageMaker is not that bad, and we do use SageMaker experiment tracking. The one thing I would say, and this is kind of, it sounds like I'm popping at SageMaker Studios a lot, is that... With the projects and everything, it's really ingrained into studios heavily in these days, but it's hard to actually see some of this stuff outside the studio. So just be a little bit careful about how you're going to use it. Like Feature Store is another good example. It's like there is good alternatives to Feature Store out there. I and mean, the DevOps one is kind of hidden away a little bit inside studios. So just make sure you're using the, um, you take that into consideration as well. So I would go on the MF Flow route because it's generally quite nice, but AWS Sage Maker experiments is and projects is an option if you want to go that route and will work out for yeah. most most people. Yeah, I think the vendor lock in concern is, is often a huge one we, we, we do see as well we, with teams. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Vendor lock is a significant concern. I don't think it's a significant concern necessarily at like the startup end, but definitely at the mm-hmm. enterprise yeah. end. Um so that that is always an important requirement if you want to take that into consideration. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sabi, I think we have a question. We do have a question in chat about deploying models to production. Peter Dudfield is asking, I was wondering if you have any experience in when to productionize a model. Too early and we don't get enough, don't get the full model or restrict data scientists too late. The project is late and has little impact. So do you have any insight to share? Too early, too late. It's... We tend to have three kind of three to four distinct stages when we start to productionize a model. Okay. So you have the initial experiment stage, pilot stage, MVP, POC kind of stage, proof that it's possible. Then you take it to the next MVP stage. Mostly at the MVP stage, we're, we're also looking at building the best model. We are looking at the data pipeline, the near ops pipeline. We necessarily won't completely focus on maybe automating all the triggering of that pipeline, for example. We'll defer that maybe to another iteration, um, just doing it based on drift or something like that. Then we won't focus on that initially. We'll put the pipeline in space so we can recreate the models and that we can trigger later, but we won't necessarily put all the automation in place. Again, it's it's that whole, we don't want to take nine months, kind of miss the point. We want to do it over incrementally. So First thing is to put the value. Next thing is to like deliver the first iteration to make sure it's good. Then it's probably building out some of those more rigorous controls around it regarding that. I'm just trying to think of any other kind of a good example too late or or too off. It do happen, but I can't think of a good example. I suppose there is times when kind of question if a model is actually really needed, if you can use statistical statistical modeling or if you can use uh, like an optimizer or, or something like that instead. So I think it's is important to think sometimes are you using ML for the sake of ML uh, and maybe you to look at something else that you can maybe get deployed quicker. That's an approach I've seen done as well to kind of offset some of that too early risk is do a more statistical based thing first and then build the model later once you know that you've got the case for the model and you've to find the problem better. So that's quite important. Again, it's it maybe in, in certain domains like document processing, intelligent document processing, it's important to 
focus on some of the harder questions regarding different formats and that kind of thing first. So some uh, on things like that, the, the viable bit might be a higher bar to judge things because you need to make sure that it is very accurate before it is out. That's that's probably the, the main thing. So that's a kind of a broad answer, but I, th I think basically it, it's uh, try to be a more flexible in approach and maybe some of the ML approaches you use to offset the likelihood of that kind of too late or too early kind of thing. You know, I've, just, I've seen people finesse a lot of tensor flow models, but maybe just a, a more simpler model might be more appropriate initially or, or something like that. Mm, awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Awesome. Fear. Okay. So this person is asked um, in the community and said, could you share use cases where you save the client a lot of money by optimizing the existing architecture? I can't name names, mm, yeah, but yes, <laughs> there was two, the biggest thing to watch on both the ML side, data side, and my previous experience is egress cost out of AWS. Okay. So especially when you're going like multi-AZ or multi-region or multi-accounts, they're the things to be really careful about. If you're sending lots of data or predictions around, that can be quite expensive. I've seen quite phenomenal savings with putting in things like VCP endpoints, things like that for just lower the cost, maybe because you're sending big files into S3 and out again between accounts. And if you don't do that, you'll get egress for your IM and that kind of thing. So that's the most expensive part is where I've seen expense is, yeah, is that kind of area sending stuff in and out. That's, that's, that's to be avoided or to be optimized. And the other thing is, is people, yeah, is, is the liberal use of instance types and firing up massive notebooks and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's the main main areas I've seen. Just egress is so expensive. I've seen that a lot in my, not just in the wisdom, before in the wisdom as well. Egress is easily expensive. So make sure that you're taking that stuff into consideration when designing your solutions. All right. Okay. Yeah. And thanks for that. This person asks, uh, how best can a team with data privacy concerns architect and build an, an ML solution on AWS? Have you had situations like that with clients? That is a great question. So there is only, <laughs> there's only answer, and I'm going to sound like when the curator is to encrypt everything and lock down encrypt, encryption on lots. And that's one of the, I uh, was saying about earlier, how like it's really easy for data scientists to go and knock out a model through studio. It's like the encryption of data is one of the things that they might not completely get and to layer the encryption and that kind of stuff. So we spend a lot of time in the encryption area, making sure that it's in layered as well that we're using different keys for different areas that kind of thing to kind of reduce those data the data privacy concerns we try to limit what data scientists can view or any engineer can view really so that you don't give away ppi psi confidential company information all the time when you're going to do you want to put lots of auditing around it so we obsess a little bit around making sure that the auditing in place when right. it gets to those kind of big concerns, that's when we see a lot more time in things like a multi-account architecture and breaking and isolating concerns and that kind of thing. So yeah. we would kind of focus on that and make sure that you limit the roles in whatever account they are in to, to limit those things. And have a if people need that data or need a maybe they don't need to complete the PCI data or whatever, or the PPI data, maybe you can make a, a sanitized version enable, uh, available for things like maybe like a recommendation engine. You don't need to include people's first names, surnames, but their, their buying trends, fair enough. You can probably include that with tokenize out, like that kind of thing. So we see a lot of that and just building lots of kind of, yeah, segregation into things like S3 or separation schemas in Redshift and lots of right. kind of control through multi-tenancy and that kind of thing. We see a, see a lot of that, both from a, yeah, from personal information point of view and from company information. There's a couple of solutions were built where the parent companies had a number of subsidiaries and each subsidiary can't see what each other subsidiary is doing. So we've kind of built multi-tenancy into in a couple of machine learning use cases as well, where we've had to ingest all the separate data, then run three separate processes or n number of processes and treat everything quite uh, separate and to make sure that we address those kind of concerns. Data privacy is kind of the main thing. The other top tip, and I don't know, it's a good thing to give out to everybody and just be uh, immensely aware of it on AWS, actually. Uh, it's not particularly because they're bad at it or they're naughty or anything like that. Yeah. Lots of the AI services 
will have opt-in or opt-out ability to share data. So like um, things like on a, just pick on Textract, for example, that would have been run trained against millions of documents, generic documents, that's fine. But what they do is there's an option to retain your documents in the system for them to train on it later. Um, so if you have any strong privacy concerns around what kind of documents you're doing, um, make sure that you always untick them for any other managed services. So just watch that with the, yeah, some of the AI managed services and the other managed services, they may retain copies of your data for their, their own purposes. So and that's normally clearly stipulated in the security section of the service. Awesome, awesome. And Phil, we are running out of time, but maybe just a final question on my end. Mm -hmm. Curious, what are like the most underrated AWS ML services that small teams can leverage today? It's not being talked about enough or, you know, they just don't just know about it. I think it's coming back to some of the ones that I just mentioned is that you can do quite complicated or not complicated, but quite useful stuff with some of the, the AWS art. Um, services. So we've done a lot in the intelligent document processing area recently, and we've chained Textract, Comprehend, maybe Translate all together using step function, that kind of thing, and got a long way there. And then we did customize it and built some own models behind that for our clients and that kind of thing to, to make it even highly more accurate. And we applied other techniques, but you can kind of, especially at like a, the proof of concept stage, you can kind of quite easy throw some of those AI services together and prove something without necessarily going too far into any ML or any ML space, really, you can kind of leverage them. So I would, I would explore more that kind of area and leverage some of those services if I was just getting started with ML. That's the biggest tip I'd give myself four years, five years ago when I was in that recommendation engine at the time. If AWS's recommendation engine was out, I'd have probably just plugged it in and given it a go, and it probably would have done a pretty good job, probably better than the statistical stuff we were doing at the time. But there you go, that would be the advice I'd give myself when I was starting out four years ago, five years ago. Awesome, awesome. Of course, that's the best practice as well. So mm -hmm. thanks a lot for sharing that, Phil. All right. Yeah, it's time to wrap things up here. Thanks so much, Phil, for coming on and sharing your expertise with us. Before we wrap things up, how can people follow you online and connect with you? Yes, there's, there's a couple of ways. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. So reach out on both those platforms. Also, occasionally I put out the uh, YouTube video either through my own channel or through um, in the Wizarding channel or through some of the community stuff. So I'm also involved in some of the AWS Community Days Summit stuff. So I put stuff out about that. If I can just say one last thing though, for those who AWS fanatics, so does reInvent at the end of the year. I'll be going, it's in Las Vegas. They're putting out the session catalog tonight, put a bit, bit of a blog out early about what I want to see in sessions, but they're putting out the session catalog or the reserve seat for the session catalog. So if you're going to reInvent any of the AWS people out there or fans, then uh, make sure you jump on that. I think it's six o'clock, so it's in about like an hour's time. So make sure you do that. So that's a bit of a shout out to those who go to reInvent and want to see some ML or analytics sessions there, or just see me. And you can just pick, um, find me in amongst 60,000 people, so hopefully. Awesome. Good to know. We'll make sure to check that out. All right. Thanks so much, Phil. We'll be back again in two weeks. And next time we'll have with us Laszlo Schragner. We'll be talking about writing clean production level ML code. So don't miss that. And uh, just another reminder that you can catch up with these discussions as a podcast later on. So in the meantime, see you on socials and in the MLOps community Slack. Thanks, everyone. Take care. MLOps Live is brought to you by Neptune AI. Remember that you can join us live at the next event and ask your questions. And you can register at neptune.ai slash events. And then make sure to search for MLOps Live in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Click follow and don't miss any episodes. Thanks and see you next time. Thank you.